Hello, my name is Sean Conway. I'm the State Soybean and Small Grains Extension Specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today I want to talk about some of the considerations going into the 2022 growing season. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board and my co-authors, uh, Dr. Spiros Mortiznes, Adam Roth, and John Gaska, for whom I wouldn't be able to present this, this information. So I'd like to give people kind of an update or a, a review of the program in general. So one of the, the programs that we run through our program is the Wisconsin Soybean Variety Testing Program. And here we're able to test soybean varieties from northern Wisconsin, which I basically call the tree line and spooner, where we have as earlier as of 0.2 maturity group bean, all the way down to southern Wisconsin, so we're, where we push up against a 3.0. This just gives uh, the audience a, a sense of the yield variability across the state. And, in northern Wisconsin in 2021, we uh, averaged 56 bushels per acre at our Spooner location. And down at Platteville, well, we actually averaged 96 bushels per acre with over a dozen varieties going over 100. So it was actually a very good growing season for the most part in 2021. Now, one of the things that allows us to do with the variety testing program is really talk about variety selection in terms of any of the inputs besides obviously land rent and some of the herbicides and fertilizers i would think your number one choice as a farmer to maximize yield is basically what variety you choose so every year we publish our variety testing information on our website which is www.coolbean.info <clears throat> and how you would read this is basically here's an example of our southern site where we had variety testing trials at arlington clinton and platteville and at each one of these gives the brand the entry, the maturity group, the day it matured, and the yield at, at three test average, as well as each individual location. And so what I really try to impress upon growers is really look at how well a variety performs across multiple environments in a given year. Back when I started at UW-Madison in 2007, we would roughly have 80% of our varieties would overlap from one year to the next. This past year, in 2021, we had only 15% of the varieties overlap. So it's much more of a challenge for varieties to, you know, or for farmers to spend time selecting varieties because you only basically get one or two years. So what we really encourage farmers to do is look at our trial, look at other trials, commercial trials, not just in Wisconsin, but at a similar latitude to really get a sense of how well that variety performed across these different environments. And choose those varieties that are the starred. And the starred variety, as you see here in our book, is one that um, does not differ from the highest yielding variety across those locations. So again, obviously yield is the number one uh, decision a farmer should make in, in basically maximizing their soybean yield. Um, one of the other choices that farmers have is basically seed composition. That would be the percent of oil or protein. And again, farmers really don't get paid at the elevator per se for that, even though in the global market we are paid on the quality. So it just is important for farmers to have that in the back of their mind. Look at high yielding varieties that are starred in our trial that also have high oil and protein content. So again, what that will do is allow farmers to uh, deliver a crop to the elevator that on the global market ha will basically move the U.S. soybean price at a higher level than our competitors in South America. We've actually seen some changes over the last five to eight years in terms of what trait farmers really look at that um, drives their seed choices. It used to be disease resistance. However, right now it's herbicides traits. And the reason for that is the glyphosate resistance we've seen specifically for uh, water hemp but other uh, um, weeds, not just in Wisconsin, but across the north central region. So herbicide trait has really moved up to rank second. If you look in the back of our book, in table 10, we list the traits. Here we have a herbicide trait for every single variety that we work through. And on an average year, we go through about 250 varieties. So it gives growers lots of choices. The next traits we also look at, and probably the third most important one that farmers look at, would be disease resistance. And in this table 10, which is the characteristics of all the soybean varieties that we uh, publish in our variety testing book, we also have the soybean cyst nematode source, uh, which primarily most of these today are PI8, PI88788, as well as the Phytophthora resistance genes. And I think we really need to go back and spend some time looking at this Phytophthora resistance genes, mainly because of some of the work that was done on Iowa State um, 
by Dr. Allison Robertson looking at when they did kind of a survey of resist of what races are out there in the soils is really not matching up well with what's being planted in terms of the genetic resistance. So I encourage farmers to get a better sense and really look at um, if they have issues with phytophthora to check what resistance they planted in their field and maybe modify that in the next growing season. And as always, brand seems to pop out as the fourth highest. So again, these are some of the choices we look at for seed selection. It's usually genetics first, or yield potential, herbicide trait, followed by disease resistance, and then followed by brand. And everything else, kind of maturity group, uh, lodging potential, and seed composition really follows after that. Now, one of the good things of us being able to manage our herbicide variety trial <clears throat> across the state of Wisconsin is we're able to look at how these traits perform against each other. So how you would read this figure right here is on the x-axis we have yield, okay? And then on the y-axis we have either the combined regions, which would be the entire state, our southern, north central, or northern regions. If you look at each bar, they're color-coded by which trait those varieties have. For example, the blue bar would be the, all the varieties that possess the E3 herbicide trait platform. Uh, the, the orange would be the LLGT27. The gray bar would be the RR2X, or Roundup Ready to Extend. And the green would be the Extend Flex Trait Platform. On the bottom here, you look at these N numbers. So across the entire state of Wisconsin, if you combine all of our locations, we had 155 E3 varieties planted, 21 LLGT27s, 17 uh, Extend, and 109 Extend Flex. If you look not just within, or excuse me, across the entire state, but more specifically within each region, we really don't see much of a difference at all among the herbicide trait platforms. So if we see here, the E3s on average yielded similarly to the LLGT27s as well as the Extend Flexes. And what that does is provide farmers a good opportunity that no matter what herbicide trait platform they choose, there are going to be high yielding starred varieties within each one of those platforms. So again, that's a good opportunity for our farmers going into the next growing season where supply, um, supply herbicides are going to be limited. So what this allows farmers to do is have options. If they can't get a hold of glyphosate, they can have either Liberty or um, basically a 240 product or a dicamba product. So again, it gives farmers choices going in the 22 growing season, knowing that on average these traits perform similarly, just pick those high yielding varieties with each, within whichever trait platform you prefer. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the management practices that we can focus in on in, in Wisconsin, or for that matter, the, the upper mis Midwest, which I'll encompass called the North Central Soybean Research Program. If you see on this figure or this graph right here, um, we see um, all of these dots. And what we were able to do is get some funding through the North so Central Soybean Research Program to collect some data from farmers to really get a handle on what management practices uh, drive the needle in terms of maximizing yield, productivity, and profitability. So what I'm gonna do is talk about some subsets of this data where we are able to collect data from over 8,000 fields and over 600,000 acres of data. So again, it's a huge data set uh, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to really get a sense of what's driving yield in different regions across the north central region which comprises anywhere between 82 and 85 percent of u.s soybean production now one of the cool things we're able to do with some of these advanced analytics is really look at and parse out among all these different farmers and their different management practices what's really driving the yield and here we see what we call a feature importance, which is driven by a random forest model, okay? And how you would read this is on the x-axis, these are the specific soil property or management decisions that a farmer does on a specific field that really has an influence on yield. On the y-axis, we have what we call feature importance, okay? And what this really tells us is the farther right you go, the more important each one of these variables is for predicting soybean yield. All right, so if we look at the top here, we see um, soybean seeding rate is very important, obviously, in predicting soybean yield. 
um, here at latitude, which would be a proxy for maturity group, because again, the north central region reaches from basically the Canadian border all the way down to southern Illinois. So we'll see anywhere from a 0.1 maturity group all the way down to you know a 4.5 to almost a 5.0. So we see a large range. So obviously, latitude and maturity group play an important role. Uh, we see pH, organic matter, which is kind of a proxy for soil health, which is very important these days, but also things that farmers have an influence over, such as seeding rate, use of a foliar fungicide, maturity group, uh, use of a foliar insecticide, row spacing, and seed treatment. So again, what we're going to do is focus in on the rest of this talk on what really influences from this list of practices that farmers can do early in the season to maximize soybean yield and profitability. We'll first start with planting date because that was one of the highest dr drivers in terms of what we can use as a farmer to do to predict yield. And here we see an, M an RMA map, uh, basically that tells us when uh, farmers can plant and be covered by crop insurance under the RMA program. If we look here, this is the best job we could do. So if you find any missing or wrong information, please let us know. But the color codes with how early you can plant your soybean and be covered for a replant under the RMA for planting date. You see most of Wisconsin is April 26th. So that's kind of the point at which we know farmers can start planting and have coverage for any type of frost damage or any replant decisions that the RMA crop insurance will cover. Okay. So with that being said, we started doing some work under that whole um, big data approach where we had those 8,000 farm fields and over, over 600,000 acres of data. And what we were able to do is dig into these regions. Uh, these have different color codes and different um, letter enumerations. So example here, this is 3R, um, which would be North Dakota and the northern part of South Dakota. What we were able to do is kind of combine all the farm fields within these TEDs to really get an idea of what these different management practices do and how they influence soybean yield. So for example, in TED 3R, we see starting roughly about April 20th, we lose 2.8 bushels per acre per week we delay planting, okay? If we dig in a little closer to home, in TED 5R, which is southern Wisconsin, we're losing basically 2.1 bushels per acre per day we delay planting past that April 20th. So what this allows farmers to do is get a sense of their environment, uh, the, the soil productivity, and really help them to kind of dive into and dig into how early they can start planting. And if the planting is delayed for whatever reason, what can be an expected yield loss based on that specific soil environment property? So again, this is a very useful tool because we see a big range anywhere from like a 1.4 to a 2.8 bushels per acre per week um, yield loss based on planting date. Now, if we look a little bit bigger and look at some of our historical data across the different Northwest region, excuse me, the North Central region of the United States, we see the delay from starting planting on May 1 to June 1 is roughly 11% on an annual basis in Wisconsin, roughly 15% in Illinois. Obviously, if we get up in North Dakota, we're pushing 23%. So there's a huge uh, you know, disparity or differences across the regions of what that delay and, and yield penalty can really come into. And again, hopefully we're able to cover that and encompass that based on the soil, physical properties, and the growing environment on our TEDs based on the previous map. But I just want to kind of give you an idea of what we've been able to capture over the last 10 to 15 years for with our own personal data across and within each individual state. Now, one of the interesting things we see is we don't always see a response to planting date, specifically early planting date. And when we dove into the data, what really kind of popped out to us is what is that water balance or water availability during pod set? So pod setting was roughly R3 uh, when we start pod setting. And for Wisconsin farmers, that'd roughly be mid-July. So depending on in the individual TED, and a lot of that has to do with some of the soil physical properties in terms of the water holding capacity or the aridity index, we can get a sense of if we have a little bit of a dry period during that pod set early seed fill period, what does that do to our yield benefit from earlier planting? And what we can see specifically in TED 3R, which would be this North Dakota region, um, 
TED 2R, which would be you know across a lot of the I states here, we can see if we're short three to four inches of water during that time frame, it basically just shrinks and removes any benefit we get from earlier planting. So obviously we've known and have known for a long time that those rainfall events during late July in August really play an important role in, in, in maximizing soybean yield. But this really further emphasizes that interaction between planting dates and water availability during that pod and seed set timing. Now we're going to kind of move away from uh, planting data, if you will, and talk about the next most common question we get related to maximizing soybean yield, and that would be row spacing. So again, I want to kind of dig into that grower data that we were able to um, bring in from those 8,000 farm fields, you know, 600,000 acres of data. We kind of broke it down in a crop reporting district. And how you would read this, if we're in southwest Wisconsin, okay, here's kind of a pie graph, so roughly 45% of the farmers in, excuse me, wrong area, roughly 40, 50% of the farmers in Southwest Wisconsin run 15 inch row spacings and the seven and a half and 30s are kind of split between the two. So it kind of gives us a sense of what farmers are doing across the North Central region in terms of their decision to plant and what row spacings they are using within these different crop reporting districts. Now, if we dig into the producer data, again, we're going back to the 8,000 farm fields, looking across 39 of these TED water regimes that we're able to, uh, to identify, we really don't see a huge difference between our narrow and wide row spacing. So again, we're looking at this graph here, and on the x-axis, this is narrow row yield, on the y-axis is wide row yield, and if you look here at each one of these dots, and, it, and where they fall in terms of this one-to-one -one line. So the one-to-one -one relationship would be this dotted line. So if they fall to the left of the dotted line, narrow row spacing in that TED would provide a positive yield advantage over wide and vice versa if they fall to the right of that dotted line. And roughly what we've been able to see is on farm fields, giving large plots farmer data, we see a slight trend towards at a, low, at a lower yield potential, the narrower rows will out yield the wide rows, okay? Then as yield potential increases, that disparity really disappears, okay? So what we're really trying to say is yield potential increases, the yield differences between wide rows and narrower rows shrinks, all right? Let's dig into this question a little bit more once we have some, some experimental data. So we went to these same states and we talked to the professors that run small plots and maybe some of the bigger plots and some replicated experimental designs. And we're able to extract and bring in all sorts of data, all right? So we have yield potential that ranges anywhere from 20 bushels per acre to 90 bushels per acre. And we kind of separated these into three yield environments, which would be the north, which was Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, North Dakota, Michigan would kind of fall into the north. The central would be the I states. And then south would be kind of the Mid-South region where we would get into southern Missouri, Arkansas, um, Georgia. If we dig into each one of those regions, we say, based on our small plot experimental design, we see roughly a 3.6 bushel yield advantage to narrow rows over wide rows in the north. Okay? We get into the southern region, okay, we see roughly a 1.6 bushel yield advantage to narrow, which is pretty, pretty small. Um, between the narrow and the wide, all right? And then we get into the south, we see a much larger yield difference, eight bushels, which really doesn't make sense because you would think in the south, they would have a much longer growing period, all right? So what we did is took the next step and dug into this. And what we really found is what's driving these row spacing yield differences are three primary factors. Number one is early maturity group beans, and that would be reflective in you know northern Wisconsin, North Dakota, northern Minnesota, where we're planting anywhere from a 01 to a 07 maturity group bean. We tend to not get as much um, above ground growth. We don't have as long of a growing season. So in those situations, we see a, a, a bigger disparity in yield potential between narrow and wide rows, all right? The other one would be late sowing dates, and that really pops up in the south where we see double crop beans uh, and just a huge range and variability based on the long growing season in the south. 
and higher VE to R3 temp. So basically what we did is looked at the time period between when that plant or that seed was placed in the ground and uh, when that soybean started to put out its first pods. And what we see in the north and the south is as the cycle length or the number of days it takes to get from planting to R3 or first part pod lengthens, that yield disparity between narrow and wide rows shrinks, okay? And we saw that in both the north and the south. So basically in the north, in Wisconsin, if we decide to plant a late maturity group bean on April 20th, we won't see much, if any, of a yield difference between a narrow and a wide row. You flip it and you start planting on June 1, you plant a little earlier in maturity group bean, then, because of the uh, condensed growing season, we'll see a much greater yield difference between narrow and wide. So again, just understanding when you're planting, what maturity groups you're selecting will help drive and let you know as a farmer, you know, can I get away with planting wide rows on April 1, excuse me, on, on April 20th, and not have a yield difference? It's probably not. You get to June 1, you probably want to go 15s or 7.5 inch, just to minimize that yield loss due to that later planting. So again, it kind of helps us describe some of the physiology that's going on within that soybean field. Okay, now we've kind of moved past the row space thing. The next question that we get in terms of agronomics, specifically early season, is what seeding rate should I do? All right, so again, we kind of dug into some of that data. We have here the average seeding rate by crop reporting district. You know, in, in southern Wisconsin, we're roughly in that 150 to 165,000 seed per acre seed drop. And again, we move into part of northern Iowa, we see that go down to roughly a bag an acre. So again, this gives everyone a sense of what we're dropping or what farmers are physically dropping on their fields. And how this really plays an interesting role is the application of variable rate technology. Farmers have invested in this, uh, mainly on the corn side of things. So we're wondering, since we've been made this, these investments on our corn planters and more farmers are planting earlier, they're using 30 inch rows, can we apply variable rate technology to our soybean operations as well? So to kind of give us a sense of and use a big data approach to this, we went through and collected yield data uh, from roughly 21,000 plots on 211 experiments across 12 states, including Ontario, Canada. And then what we were able to do is break these into these clusters. And cluster one uh, would be what we would classify as a lower yield environment just based on the latitude, uh, the yield potential. And we have cluster two in red and cluster three in green. So as we go forward, we talk about this, just kind of in the back of your mind, if you're listening to this, kind of get a sense of what cluster you would fall into. And that would help us make seeding rate recommendations for your farm based on what some of this data that we we're able to pull out. Um, within each cluster then, we were able to break it into these yield environments. So basically a low yield environment, we classify it as anything 58 bushels or less. A high yield environment would be anything 71 bushels and greater. And then obviously the middle would be between 58 and 71. So just to just give you all a sense of the cluster you're in and the yield environment within each cluster. And this really will help us set that seeding rate in our prescriptions for our planting considerations. Now, the first question we always have is on stand. And one of the interesting things that we pulled out of here is in a high yield environment, it really doesn't matter what your stand is. We see no relationship between either early season percent stand or late season percent stand in a high yield environment. So again, in these high yield environments, we tend to see a lot of um, of uh, plant to plant, soybean to soybean uh, competition, and we see a lot of death, all right? So in this sense, in a higher yield environment, if you know you're gonna get a good stand, you really don't wanna drop a lot of seeds and you can save some of those uh, dollars by decreasing your seeding rate, because in fact, we see no relationship between stand and yield in these high yield environments. However, you flip it and you go to these low yield environments, and this would be under 58 bushels per acre and less, we see a very strong relationship between early and late season stand and yield. So what this really tells us or informs us that as a farmer, and if you are planning into a tough environment where you generally have challenges getting a stand, 
might be an opportunity for you to increase your seeding rate because we see that relationship between stand both early and late and yield in a low yield environment, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you two graphs here. Okay, these go through the agronomic optimal seeding rate, which would give you the highest yield. So we're aiming at 95% yield potential. The next one would be economic. And you'll see a big difference between these two, but let's kind of focus in on some interesting points between the agronomic and economic optimal. So let's say we're in cluster one, okay, which would be northern Wisconsin in a low yield environment, okay, which would be under 58 bushels per acre. The agronomic optimal seeding rate to maximize yield, by maximizing yield, I mean get you 95% of your yield potential, would be dropping 237,000 seeds per acre, all right? Now we flip it, and you're in cluster three, you know, you're in an I state, you're in a high yield environment, you're over 71 bushels per acre, we're looking at the agronomic optimal seeding rate is roughly a bag an acre, okay? So again, this really gives us a sense to really fine tune our planter based on the soil properties and historic yield potential of that land. All right, so again, this is the agronomic. Let's talk about economics, specifically going into 2022 when economics is gonna drive a lot of decisions. And lo and behold, we see a big drop. We go back to cluster one, okay, in a low yield environment, we've dropped roughly 100,000 seeds we've taken out of the operation. and We've moved down to 133,000 seed drop would be your economic optimal seeding rate. And in basically cluster three in a high yield environment, it's roughly a bag an acre. So in short, you know, going into a you know a a, a high a highly expensive growing season, I would still recommend that for most farmers, you basically buy a bag an acre. Don't spend a lot of time doing variable rates uh, on that, um, and then just go at that rate. If you do have a variable rate planter. What I would recommend if you have a field, you have a history of white mold, I would still buy a bag an acre, 140,000 seed count. In the highly productive areas, in those areas where you know you get white mold, you know, down in the valley, um, I would only drop 110, 120,000 seeds in that area. You get along the edge of the field where you have some compaction, you get along like the knoll, the clay knoll, instead of dropping 140 there, Drop 160 to 165,000 seeds up there. So again, it's a simple way to basically start with a, an average of a bag an acre and distribute those seeds so that you can maximize the productivity on a per acre basis uh, based on seed costs and yield as well. Now with these precision planters, and again, we've seen some of the questions and data looking at the picket fence, you know, um, you know, basically that within the seed, within plant rows or um, within row plant spacing. The question on the soybean side is, are these precision planters necessary uh, for profitable soybean producers? Because you know, just because we can make a picket fence out there for soybean, is it profitable? Do I need to be able to invest in this technology on the soybean side of things? So I'm gonna focus this on this blue one, which is study one, which would be an equipment comparison. And again, this is not an all-inclusive um, equipment comparison, so uh, this is just kind of a quick and dirty, but kind of just give us an overall general sense of how important plant spacing is on the soybean side. We looked at a random drop, uh, which is our cone planter, okay, would be basically our controlled spill, if you will, part of the experiment. And then we use a John Deere 1705 vacuum precision planter, which would be able to uh, allow us to uh, more precisely drop those seeds in a uniform manner. All right, so right now we're gonna really dig into some of the yield questions between a random cone and our vacuum precision planter. For those of you who are interested in pictures, here's our design. We looked at this in 30 inch rows. We looked at a couple varieties just to look to see if there's any variety interactions. Um, and then here's our precision vacuum. And then this is me just dropping random seeds in a random planter to see what really happens, okay? So let's kind of dig into this and I'll explain this uh, graph in a second. Again, we have yield on the x-axis right here. Um, then we have seeding rate on the y and we dropped anywhere from 40,000 seeds per acre. That was an exact seed count. We did not really adjust for germ, we just, we just dropped 40,000 seeds all the way up to a seed drop of 160,000 seeds per acre. And then each one of these bars represents the different planters. 
So we have in blue the random um, drop, which would be me on that cone planter. And orange, we have the precision planting, which would be that John Deere vacuum precision planter. So let's start way on the right and look at where we see a yield drop off. So interestingly enough, we go from planting um, anywhere from 160,000 seeds per acre all the way down to dropping 80,000 seeds per acre. And again, the planting timing for this wouldn't necessarily be what I would classify as early, but I would call it on time. And we don't see any yield differences between the seeding rates from 160 to 80,000, nor do we see any interaction with precision versus random. So this basically tells us if we're planting anywhere from 80 to 160,000, we do not really need to have a precision planter on the soybean side of things out there to maximize yield. If we drop down to 60,000 plants per acre, again, we still don't see any differences between the precision planter in orange or the random drop, which would be me riding that comb planter in blue. And, but we do see a yield drop. So again, the yield drop in what we tend to see, and this is pretty uniform from what we've seen across years of working on seeding rate trials, is roughly 80, 100, 80 to 100,000 plants per acre and up, we don't see any yield differences. And here we're down to 80, we see, a, excuse me, we're down to 60,000 seed drop uh, we do see a yield difference based on the number of seeds we put out there on a per acre basis, but we don't see any differences between um, that precision and random planter. It's not until we get all the way down to dropping 40,000 seeds per acre, which giving a 90% germ, which roughly be only 32,000 live seeds on a per acre basis on soybean, do we see a difference between a precision and random drop. So. Again, the big picture here is I don't really think we need a picket fence on soybean. We do not really need to invest in that technology on the soybean side of things unless we're really dropping and planting suboptimal populations, which down the future, once uh, the technology increases and seed prices maybe continue to increase, we may get down to a lower seeding weight where that picket fence comes into play and we need that precision planter, but I just don't think we're there right now. Okay. And the good thing about that last figure and this figure is it really kind of shows some data that really replicates itself. And what, what this basically tells us is that if you're a farmer and you're going out and you're doing stand counts um, based on what, that, what the number of plants on a per acre basis this is, you really don't need to do anything until you are on, in that sub 40,000 plants per acre. And at that point, you, you just leave that stand alone Okay, do not tear it up and you just plant directly into that existing stand. So again, it's good to see how the data we have from um, 19 and 20 is similar to the data that we were able to come up from, from 2014 to 2018. So again, it just makes me as a researcher more comfortable when the data lines and it's really not out of whack. Okay. All right, so the reason I threw this slide up here is this V2 growth stages. This is generally when we are out there doing some of these you know, stand count decisions. That's when we really make that decision. But also, we have some questions about applying nitrogen on soybean. All right, we get this on an annual basis, uh, more so as our yields have to continue to increase and the price on a per bushel of soybean continues to increase. Again, the average price as of of October 31st, I believe, was $12.10 for um, a, a bushel of soybean. So what we really want to do is really understand this nitrogen cycle and what's going on. So when we get to the V2 growth stage, where we have two open trifoliates, that's when we begin to see this active nitrogen fixation. Okay, That's when these nodules are, are basically starting to work and begin to actively fix nitrogen. And these nodules, here's a good example of these, once you cut them open and you see the nice pink coloration, which would tell us that they're active, we tend to see nitrogen fixation continue all the way through the R6 growth stage. So basically from, from V2 all the way through the seed fill period through R6, we tend to see nodules forming an active nitrogen fixation. And that's really important when we think about demand and requirements of nitrogen as we move forward in the next few slides. Okay, a couple of key points to really note, and we get this question quite often. The number of total nodules is not strongly correlated to how much nitrogen is fixed. So nodule efficiency is much more important. Because generally we'll have people go out, 
the soybeans might be a little pale yellow. Uh, we'll go out, we'll pop some plants, we'll go out there and count, count the nodules and say, wow, our nodule count is really low. Well, again, nodule number in, it, in and of itself is not a good predictor of, of basically nitrogen efficiency and nitrogen fixation. So I just want to make that point as we go in to the next questions about do I apply additional nitrogen on soybeans. So I would think it's about 10 years ago, I think some, um, some old data and a little bit of misinformation came forward that um, would suggest that soybean really needed 500 pounds of nitrogen to hit that 100 bushel per acre yield goal. And we kind of thought about that and based on some of the old existing data that kind of made sense. So one of my former graduate students, um, Adam Gaspar, kind of took on this idea of going through and doing this nutrient uptake and partitioning work. And I want to talk a little bit about that right here. And what we see is in today's modern genetics, that soybean requires and will uptake roughly 375 pounds of nitrogen okay, to make a 100 bushel soybean crop. So I would argue in most situations, given the organic matter, specifically in the I states, but also parts of Wisconsin, where we have this capacity to hit 100 bushels per acre between um, the mineralization of the organic matter and what's available in the soil and nitrogen fixation, most of the time, there's enough nitrogen out there that we do not have to hit that additional nit add additional nitrogen to hit this 100 bushel yield goal. Okay, let's dig a little bit further into this a little bit to explain that um, a little more detail. So in this high yield situation, which would be any soybeans in this case that were basically yielding over 82 bushels per acre, what we're able to do is kind of get a sense of where and when that nitrogen is being uptaken into the plant and how it's being partitioned from the different plant parts into seed. All right, so how you would read this figure right here is this would be on the x-axis, this would be percent of total cumulative nitrogen. So this would be zero to 100%. On the y-axis, this would be either days after emergence or below, we have the specific growth stages anywhere from VE which is basically emergence all the way to R8, which is physiological plant maturity and harvest ripe. Okay, and then on the Z axis, we have total nitrogen uptake in terms of pounds of total nitrogen. All right, in each one of these figures, we see here these different plant parts and they're color coded. So this dark, dark blue would be, nit or excuse me, the amount of nitrogen in the leaves. Uh, this dark brown would be the amount of nitrogen being deposited in the seeds. All right, so we'll, we'll be showing a few of these figures. I just want to make sure everyone is aware and how to read this as we move forward. A couple interesting things on the nitrogen side of things is we are still, by we, I mean that soybean plant is still uptaking, you know, basically removing nitrogen from the soil, from the, from the nodules, um, roughly 40% of its total nitrogen still at R5.5, which would be if you take a soybean pod, you hold it up to a light, and the seed half covers that cavity, we're still uptaking 40% of our nitrogen from that point forward, which is crazy, okay? That's just how that plant continues to uptake nitrogen and shove it into that, those plant parts. And more specifically, if we look here, remobilize that nitrogen into that seed, which ends up going to the elevator and the biggest uh, plant uh, constituent would be protein, which that nitrogen is going into to driving that protein content, all right? Now, another interesting thing is when during the growth season is that nitrogen uptake occurring? And again, we're focusing on these high yield environments, which was 82 bushels and greater. Um, and we see here roughly the peak nitrogen uptake rate is just prior to R5, which is that basically beginning seed. So it gives us a sense of right when those, that soybean um, plant is starting to set seed, that's when that max nitrogen uptake rate occurs. And that makes sense, you know, because that's where the demand and the requirements that need is in that soybean seed. And the other cool thing we're able to pull out of this is that based on yield level, um, and we'll have here the low yield, which is be 54 bushels and less, Average, which would be an average over all of our plots is 66 bushels. And high, which is 88, excuse me, 82 bushels and higher, is the day that plant dies, all right, which would be roughly R8, that soybean plant in a high yield situation is still taking up 
of its peak nitrogen rate. That's crazy to me. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't really um, see in the, the, the need for adding additional nitrogen. That plant is able to continue to uptake and mobilize that seed, uh, that nitrogen into that seed, even basically up to the day that plant dies. So that's a pretty cool recent new finding that's changed in today's modern genetics versus what we used to plant 30 years ago, okay? So now, when we get back to the end, remember we said roughly 100 bushel soybean crop uh, would uptake 375 pounds of nitrogen, which is basically 3.75 pounds per bushel of seed. When you deliver this to the elevator, we're looking at a 100 bushel crop will deliver 330 pounds of nitrogen. So basically, every bushel of soybean has 3.3 pounds of nitrogen in that seed, which is primarily shown in that protein constituent. So again, it gives us a sense of most of that nitrogen, you know, that soybean plant is taking up, leaves that plant and goes directly into that seed as the form of nitrogen. Now, we want to revisit this question of adding additional nitrogen to the system. So we kind of went in and did the synthesis analysis, if you will, and we looked at 207 environments across the country. And how you would read this figure is this is yield on the x-axis. This is nitro applied nitrogen rate at different times, anywhere from zero to almost 500 pounds of actual N per acre. And what this would show us is the relationship between applied nitrogen, each one of these lines, and yield. And in short, what we see, irregardless of yield environment, we don't see a very positive response to adding additional nitrogen into the system. And in fact, when we looked at the statistical, statistical analysis, basically the addition of nitrogen only captured 1% of the yield variability. All right. So basically my point here is until you get the other 99% of the yield variability in that soybean crop determined, um, I wouldn't mess around and add additional nitrogen, specifically given the end prices we're seeing in 2022. Quickly, I want to go through the last couple things um, in terms of the demands and needs. And I think we all understand the relationship between potassium need and requirements and yield. So if we look here, 100 bushel soybean crop requires 117, um, will remove 117 pounds of fertilizer equivalent K2O. So again, the point I wanna make here is, as we're investing and in making decisions for 2022 in terms of investments, uh, potassium removal, potassium need is something we really need to consider. I know the prices are high, but again, given the bang for the buck, um, understanding what your soil test levels are, what last year's removal are, and really understanding the yield penalty we can uh, you know, incur by not applying potassium if we're at that low rate would be uh, detrimental to the economic profitability of a farming system. A couple quick things I really want to go through really quick before we end up here today on the potassium uptake side of things. Um, right now we see a much earlier uptake versus what we saw on the nitrogen side. This is roughly between, you know, right between the R2 and R3 growth stage, which would probably be a 10 days, two weeks earlier than when we saw where we saw the nitrogen um, maximum uptake rate just prior to R5. Okay. The other interesting thing is in terms of uh, vegetative uh, remobilization um, on the on the soybean side of thing in a high yield situation, the uptake after R5.5 is only 9%, roughly 10%. Remember, on the soybean side of things, in terms of the nitrogen component, we are uptaking over 40% of our nitrogen demands and needs after R5.5. So it really shows us the difference of how and when these different nutrients are being uptaken in that soybean plant. The other interesting thing to see is look how much of that potassium still remains in that vegetative material, uh, much more so than there was in soybean. So I always classify um, soybean as a potassium pig, if you will. It will take up as much total potassium as it possibly can. It'll sit there and hold it in its leaves and in its stems and its petioles. It will partition what it needs into the soybean seed to drive and maximize yield. Then everything else will go back onto the land as, um, as residue, all right? And we'll make that point a little bit earlier to make sure that if you do bale soybean residue, um, that it's you make sure you uh, account for how much fertilizer 
K you have removed if you do bale that soybean um, residue up as 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 bot, fed, uh, as fodder or bedding. The last point and the last uh, nutrient I want to talk about is sulfur. And the reason we get this is there's been a lot of you know questions about you know where are we on the where are we are or where are we in terms of sulfur demand and requirements. We all understand the Clean Clean Air Act. The fact that you know the smokestacks were scrubbing um, a lot of that uh, the, the, the deposition of sulfur out in these stacks and is no longer being given to us, i.e., for free, uh, based on that um, Clean Air Act. So a couple quick points to remember is that you know sulfur is what we call a secondary nutrient, and again in these high you know mineral high yield situations, we're only looking at uh, taking up roughly 20 pounds of sulfur. Uh, and removing roughly 14, not 14, roughly 14 pounds on a on a per bushel, excuse me, on a on a per pound basis. So we're not taking up a lot, okay, on a per acre basis. So I want to make that point really come through. But again, we really want to know is given what we've seen because we've started seeing some sulfur deficiency on alfalfa in Wisconsin. We've started seeing some on the corn silage side of things. Obviously, we have some challenges with sulfur on, on sand in terms of availability. You know, wh wh where are we sitting in with a need on sulfur, uh, adding it into a soybean, corn, soybean rotation? So the question we all have is, does sulfur or does soybean respond to sulfur in Wisconsin? So this is part of a multi-state um, project, and we'll just focus in on the Wisconsin data today. More of this will be published on my website, www.coolbean.info, early in 2022. But what we really wanted to look at is the application of different sulfur sources and balancing off with some urea to balance the nitrogen and look at, you know, can we make some of these amendments and what does that really do to soybean yield, okay? So here are, are basically the treatments we applied. We had um, untreated check would be no, no fertilizer application. We had different rates of AMS, calcium sulfate, and urea. And again, the urea here was just basically to balance off the nitrogen and the ammonium sulfate so that we can see if we're getting a response from the sulfur or from the nitrogen okay, applications. Okay, so if we look and just pooled all 18 environments, all right, what we see here is across all 18 environments in 2019 and 2020, we don't see any response to adding additional sulfur to the system. So again, if you just took the big picture, there's no response to any of these different treatments, either sulfur um, or the combination of sulfur and nitrogen or nitrogen alone. So then we're like, well, obviously there's soil environment differences. What about a location by year interaction? And in fact, as we would expect, we did see a location and year interaction. And we actually had five of the 18 locations by years had treatment differences. However, only one time, of those 18, or excuse me, one time out of the five that we had treatment differences, did we see the non-treated check differ from the highest treatment, all right? And this is just the example of what treatment that would be. That would have been our Platteville location in 2020, where our non-treated check yielded roughly 75.6 bushels per acre, and it differed from these applications of calcium sulfate at 10 pounds of sulfur, AMS at 20 pounds of sulfur at 18N, uh, AMS at 10 and 9, calcium sulfate at 30, and AMS at 30 and 20. So again, one out of 18 times did we see a difference um, from applying an additional nutrient amendment that produced greater yield that are non treated control. So I guess the point here is really having an understanding of your system, the soil type that you have, and where we kind of can place sulfur into the system to maximize soybean yield. Um, lastly, I want to quickly talk about this nutrient uptake and removal calculator. Uh, we did see unexpectedly high yields this last year in 2020, excuse me, 2021 in terms of soybean. Uh, much fa many farmers were crazy excited about much greater yield given the environment we had. And I do know going into 2022, there are some questions about, you know, soybean on soybean and how much nutrients were uh, removed. And if I remove stover, how much should I add back in um, and how much was removed with a seed? So we have this handy dandy uh, nutrient uptake and removal calculator, which is on my website, www.coolbean.info. 
And what you can do is either put in your expected yield that you would be looking forward to removing in 2022, or if you're going beans on beans, you look at your actual yield of what you pulled off that field in uh, basically 2021, you put it in here and you hit calculate. Uh, just for purposes of showing an example, I put 80 bushels per acre in there and you hit calculate and boom, this is the output. So in terms of your removal, um, and I'll just focus on these top three just, just uh, to give everyone an example. So basically an 80 bushel soybean crop removed roughly 60 pounds of fertilizer equivalent P2O5 almost 100 pounds of fertilizer equivalent K2O, and roughly 13 pounds of, fer of, of sulfur, okay? So again, this just kind of gives you an idea of what was physically removed as grain and delivered to the elevator. For those farmers then that actually went through and, and uh, bailed off some of that uh, soybean residue and, and use it as um, uh, stover or as bedding, um, I always want them to really think about what that cost is to the system. So per ton of dry matter, okay, you remove roughly five pounds of fertilizer equivalent uh, P2O5 and roughly 39 pounds of fertilizer equivalent K2O. So just kind of get a sense if you did bail this off, understand what you did remove for both N, P, and K. And it gives you a sense of what you need to add back in the system, or at least calculate that back in the system for making fertilizer decisions for the 2022 growing season. So in short, I wanna kind of give us, wrap things up and give everyone an idea of, of what we're doing. So I always use in a bean pod um, as an example. So number one, you know, if you're gonna spend money in 2022, and best in high yielding genetics. I mean, that's a no brainer. Every year we see anywhere roughly to 20 to 25 bushel yield a difference between the highest yielding variety and the lowest yielding variety within a given region and or location, all right? Given the expected price, we're gonna be looking at, uh, you know, contracting out 10 to $12. You know, if you pay an extra $15 per, um, per unit of seed for a higher yielding new, new variety, that's well worth the, the risk of, of going through there and having a 20 bushel yield differences between high and low yielding genetics. So the point I'm making is just don't go buy cheap seed because you don't want to um, basically save yourself into, into the poverty. Number two, uh, as you're making these decisions for genetics, remember we saw no differences across trade platforms. So I really, you know, obviously focus on the genetics, but if you're looking, do I, should I choose the Extend Flex platform? Should I choose LG27? Uh, should I choose the E3 platform? You know, basically make your choice based on your farming operation, what platform you want to use on your farm, and then within that platform, go and select high yielding varieties or starred varieties out of our program to help make that decision. The next thing, Prioritize your soybean planting to maximize yield. And you know, we can always say plant early. Um, that's kind of hard. Every year is a little different. I know in, in 2021, I had farmers finish both corn and soybeans before May 1. First time they've ever done it in 40 years of planting. Uh, so again, by early, I might just prioritize it based on is that soil fit? What's the long-term uh, weather forecast? And you know, can I go in and not mud these soybeans in? Because as a, as a friendly reminder, you can get sidewall compaction in soybean just as easily as you can in, in, in corn, okay? And also remember, if you plant early, okay, soybean yield response to row spacing is minimized. And what I mean by that, even in a northern environment, which I would classify Wisconsin as, if you're planting on April 20th, you're not going to see much of a difference between going out there and drilling those beans, putting them in 15-inch row beans or putting them in 30 inch row beans. So you have a lot more flexibility in terms of row spacing when you plant early um, in our northern environments. Um, next, base your soybean seeding rates on historic field yield potential. Remember, buy a bag an acre. In Wisconsin, when we're fighting white mold, only drop like 110, 120,000 seeds in those uh, highly productive white mold areas. Uh, drop 160, 165,000 seeds on the knolls on the headlands where we might have some compaction. Also remember that we do not need a picket fence in soybean. 
based on the average seeding rates that most farmers are doing, 100 to 160,000 based on where you are in the state, you don't need a precision planter to be able to drop seed in that range. It's only when we're suboptimal ranges and our data would suggest under 60,000 where that packet fence or that is, is required to maximize yield. And by maximize yield, I mean just show a difference between the precision versus the random spill. And lastly, I know we're really tight on dollars in 2022 and fertilizer prices are crazy. I would encourage farmers to invest in potassium, invest in K. If your removal, you know, if you grew soybeans, you're going beans on beans, or your soil tests indicate you're, you know, lower your requirement. So invest in that potassium uh, just to help maximize our yield. And remember, there's a lot of disease um, and insect relationships that we have in Wisconsin. Now remember, we haven't had soybean aphids in a while, but remember, when we have soy, uh, excuse me, potassium deficiencies showing up in soybean, we tend to see a spike or an increase in soybean aphids. So there's these relationships between low fertility values um, with diseases and insects. So just maintain your K levels. Um, even though it might be a little bit more than you want to spend, I think in the long run, especially if it's own, own land, you're going to be well off. And lastly, think carefully before you invest in nitrogen soy and sulfur on your soybean. I think our data is pretty clear given the nitrogen prices specifically and then in the low risk for having a significant yield gain that would pay for that in a normal year, much less in a high end input year, I would probably pretty much cut nitrogen out of my system and just base sulfur on field history, what you know and what your um, past history has told us and what type of system you're in if you're removing a lot of residue, which could remove sulfur uh, from your system or if you're in, in more of a sandy soil where we could see some leaching. So with that, if you have any further questions, um, go to my website, which is www.coolbean.info, or follow me at Twitter, at BadgerBean, where we continually put up information um, based on all the research and all the information that we find um, in Wisconsin. So thank you for your time, and have a good day.